My name is Sunny Hunnell, editor of uh, Liberal Conspiracy, and we're here to talk about um, NHS campaigning. And it's going to be a fairly free-flowing debate and discussion. Uh, we want you to uh, get involved, and we want to hear from our panelists in terms of what they've been doing, or what they are planning to do, more importantly, in terms of the NHS bill, or campaigning on it, or what do they think needs to be done in terms of stopping the NHS bill. So, um, in fact, I think I'm going to let everyone introduce themselves, but what I'm going to do is just basically ask them questions, and then I'll try and bring you into the, uh, into the debate so we can just have a, a, an interesting discussion. I'm going to start with Clive. Clive Peedle has uh, just launched the National Health Action Party. That's correct and um, is looking to try and recruit people, but also start campaigning on the NHS, specifically on um, getting people uh, into seats uh, where they think they can take out um, specific <laughs> MPs which were you know, against the, uh, were supporting the NHS bill. Uh, so if you want to tell, Clive, people where you're at with, the, with this party and what are your immediate plans? Uh, yeah, thanks, Sonny. Uh, well, thanks for inviting me and giving uh, our party the opportunity to come and speak here. Uh, yep, yeah, uh, I'm also uh, co-chair of the uh, uh, NHS Consultants Association uh, and uh, co-leader of this new party, the National Health Action Party, uh, and the other co-leader is uh, Dr. Richard Taylor, uh, who won the uh, Wire Forest uh, constituency over the Kidderminster Hospital campaigns and had two parliamentary uh, sessions. Um, the party is uh, currently registering with the Electoral Commission, so that's where we're up to at the moment. Um, we have an executive committee uh, that's been formed, including a treasurer with a professional background in accountancy, and also a health policy uh, uh, academic as well. Uh, so uh, we've got all the right people on board. We also have a cephologist um, uh, on the committee too. Um, so we need to set up a bank, bank account that's being set up at the moment and then we're really looking forward to uh, getting a, uh, a broad membership and followership of the organisation. So we're really in the sort of fledgling stages and we feel strongly that social media can be really helpful in terms of building uh, the party and actually this offers a unique opportunity for people to get involved in shaping a brand new political party so we think this is quite exciting. and. I'm very much here to listen to what people have got to say here to give us ideas about how we're going to maximise uh, that possibility. Excellent. Um, Claire, you um, campaigned quite strongly against the NHS bill, um, but now that the bill is passed, you're in a slightly different space, aren't you? I mean, wh where do you see uh, the Royal College standing on the NHS bill, or wh where do you see uh, things going forward for your organisation? Thank you, Sonny. It, it's strange when people say I campaign strongly, it didn't feel like I was campaigning. What the Royal College of GPs were doing was raising the concerns that were being voiced by a number of our 44,000 GP members from across the country. And we were raising concerns, as many of you here will know, that were actually not just being voiced by doctors, but were being voiced by many other uh, individuals, organisations. So. We didn't set out to campaign per se. Uh, we we did what we we have to do, which is to to protect uh, services for our patients. And just to put things in context, the RCGP is not a political organisation. It is apolitical. Its role is around improving standards, quality of care, sets exams, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what are we going to be doing from now on? Well, we're still raising the concerns. We still have many many fears about what is going on, as many of you do not just around the reorganisation, which is bad enough, but around uh, the efficiency savings or cuts. I never quite know when an efficiency saving becomes a cut, actually. Uh, and what's happening to our services. And in fact, many of you are reading the, 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 the bankruptcy of hospitals with GPs also uh, struggling to be delivering services. So we will, as a college, continue to, to be a very loud voice protecting services for our patients and actually expressing the, the fears and the concerns that our patients are telling us about their NHS. Excellent. Um, Sean, you're with uh, Unison and you're campaigning specifically uh, uh, against the NHS cuts and NHS mm -hmm. um, bill uh, across the country. Would you mind telling us some of the stuff that you're doing and are up to? 
Yeah, um, Unison from the start was out against this bill and we were uh, sort of trying to mobilise our members. We've got around 450,000 members in health but also we are an organisation of 1.4 million members and so we have got a lot of mobilising that we can do and now that the Act has passed there are still things and we are, will continue to campaign against the Act. A couple of things that we're doing is, for example, everything that now happens to the NHS we feel has to be put very squarely at the feet of the, this government and we need to continue to really toxify the NHS for this government because two years ago when Cameron had that wonderful poster of I'll cut the deficit but not the NHS a lot of people believed him and I think something that we as a campaigner is across the board and across the social media movement and the online activists can be proud of is that we toxified the NHS for this government. We have to continue to do that. We have to continue to think about, and some of the questions I'd like to pose to everyone in the, in the room is, how do we continue to do that? How do we continue to keep the NHS on the front pages of the papers like we have done for the last 18 months, but in a negative way, so that actually when it comes to the election, we will get rid of the people who did this to us. Um, also, we are working with um, colleagues across the campaign movement about how we get people to influence the NHS and also looking at how we mobilise on a local level. The bill gave us something to mobilise at a national level. It's now starting to fragment, so we're now looking at mobilising people at a local level, but how do we keep those people in touch with each other? So, for example, when you've got your Hitchinbrook Hospital in Eastern region, how do we broaden that out to the whole of the UK and tell people across the country, this is why you need to support those colleagues in Eastern region, because what's happening there is going to be a domino effect. We are fighting, for example, in the South West. 20 trusts have come together to leave or to deviate from the national agenda for change framework. Why is that so important to what, all of us? Because our national framework is one of the only <coughs> national things left in the NHS. And if that goes, it is another way of leading to fragment, fragmentation of the health service. So how do we get people to realise what's going on in the South West is something that's important to us all? So there's things like that that we need to be thinking about, but also the cuts agenda and actually getting the two together. So that's some of the, the, the things that Unison will be doing. We will continue to campaign against the Act. We will continue to make sure that we have an NHS that's there. The other big thing as well is there is a review of the NHS constitution happening at the moment. And Christina McInerney, who is the National Secretary of the Health <coughs> Team, is involved in that constitution review. And we need to make sure that the constitution stays as it is, because for us that is a fallback position. We have the constitution that can still says that there should be a free and comprehensive health service for all. And if that goes, then what happens to our National Health Service? There's some things around the constitution that we're doing as well. And so for people who um, want to get involved in activism on the NHS or say maybe want to know what Unison are doing or want to get involved in Unison or join Unison to uh, campaign against the NHS bill, what would they be able to do? What have you done so far and what, what could people do? So you can get involved. There's lots of different ways. Things like, you know, you can follow us. We've got our own um, Facebook group. We've got our own t Twitter accounts. So we'll be sending those out. So um, we're at the moment doing a survey. So we're surveying. Um, we've had 665 responses as of yesterday. It's an online survey of people who want to get involved in the NHS and influence the NHS. We're setting up an e-network of those people. Uh, we've got a guide, you know, practical guide. But also I would just tell people to get active. If you get active online and become a million voice um, volunteer, so that's an e-volunteer, so uh, along with 38 Degrees, uh, we were involved with the TUC on doing the adopt a peer and sending out emails to MPs, and we, I think we'll need to be doing more of that because also to mobilise around some of the local issues. There are lots of local issues happening, for example, what's going on in North West, North West London with the, the cuts that are going on up there with A&E and stuff, so we need to start <laughs> mobilising people. So I would just say, you know, get active in whatever way you can, and if you haven't done, there has never been a time to get active in your trade union or your professional association or join one. There's never been a greater need than there is now. So just get active and let's save the NHS and reclaim it is more what we're looking at. It's about reclaiming it. It's not about defending it. It's about reclaiming it back for us. Um, okay. So, uh, Tim, I'm just going to bring you in briefly. Tim, uh, you're at UK Uncut and you've done obviously a lot of activism around NHS in the past. Tell us about how, uh, what you found from that. I mean, you know, there was some positive co coverage, there was some negative coverage. Um, you know, is, is, is the is UK Uncut going to carry on focusing on the NHS? Um, is this working? I don't yeah. know. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah thanks, Sonny. Um, so I think the th 
So probably the four kind of actions we did were the emergency operation whereby we turned high street banks and tax avoiders into um, healthcare centres, people dressed up as healthcare workers and basically turned banks into their public services they were under threat of being cut. Um, we also did block the bridge, block the bill whereby we occupied Westminster Bridge and that provided a, provided a popular um, platform so that people from walks of life could get involved <coughs> in um, an action um, to tell the government that we wanted to reject the health and social care bill. And for example, we also use NHS messaging now a lot more in our actions. So for example, with the Nick Clegg Street Party outside his house, we had an NHS block and there were prominent activists health activists who spoke at the, the demo themselves and a lot of uh, the, the groups who'd worked with in healthcare and healthcare groups uh, came along and were part of the action. So like, we want to take those kind of connections and alliances forward in the future. Um, for example, we're doing skill shares on direct action, on the media and legal aspects of actions um, with local groups and healthcare groups and unions. Um, for example, today, I don't know if you know, but actually at this moment, there is an action going on at this moment on uh, Virgin Healthcare. So the fact that Virgin are now, uh, as part of the privatisation and outsourcing of um, <coughs> care and other um, provision, there's actions around uh, the UK on Oxford Street um, protesting against this at Virgin stores. So we're, ha we're going to keep on promoting and sharing those actions with people, so it's really good to see that people are taking that idea of direct action on. Um, we're going to continue to promote the NHS and all our actions, um, potentially do our own actions again in the future, depending on how things develop, look at um, healthcare think tanks and private businesses which are going to benefit from the, the changes that are coming in, and yeah, like support and promote those actions like I mentioned before. Just, um, I want to get your thoughts on this. It seems to me that there is uh, four important uh, strands here. You've got direct action, you've got union action, you've got uh, you know people, professionals working with the NHS who are quite annoyed by it, and you've got um, you know uh, people, well also actually there is overlap in terms of people working within the NHS, but also people who are looking more directly at Westminster. But does it feel, does it not feel like actually there's four different silos here to, a, to an extent where um, you know, maybe enough information is not being shared between um, some of the think tanks with direct action people, or is is uh, are the unions doing enough to work with, say, direct action people um, in order to help them, and vice versa in terms of campaigning? Um, you know, I mean, I'd be interested in that. I mean, do, do you think, uh, Sean? I mean, <laughs> maybe slightly politically sensitive, but do you think that? Um, Unison would focus on their own work, or would would we be able to see some more collaboration between, say, UK and Car and and Unison on this? I mean, what do you think about that? I think you know, the one thing I can say about Andrew Lansley and David Cameron over the last two years is united a group of individuals who aren't, you know, we're not well known in health for, we all have our different politics and we all have different ways of coming in. It's the same in the campaign arena. And ne never did one man unite the, the group as well as he did. So suddenly instead of arguing with each other, we all started getting quite angry with him. And I think that's one of the things I think we're very keen on is what has worked in the last year was there were lots of us, but we were all going on the, along the same way. And I think there, there, there is some fear that that could be lost. You know, it ended up with basically practically every trade union, every professional association, <coughs> campaign group, pro, uh, patient association, keep our NHS public, it, you know, UK and cut all against this bill. And I think actually that's what raised the profile of the bill so, so strong. And unfortunately, that only happened the last you know, two, three months before it went through. So I think there is some stuff around us l working together and talking, and even if it's not seen to, that we are working together, that we are having those conversations behind the scenes. And there is times when it's more appropriate for UK and CUT to do it, but there have been those conversations behind the scenes, and maybe sometimes in the last two years it hasn't been obvious that those conversations were going on, but they were going on behind the scenes, and it was about sort of us deciding who was the most appropriate voice, like 38 Degrees. 38 Degrees did stuff that we never would be able to, because if we do it, people say, what a surprise the trade unions are against this. They're a vested interest, but 38 Degrees were able to do stuff, but we were then able to talk to them and sort of say, you know, and work with them and kind of do, and 
right. those conversations do still happen and I think that needs to continue to happen and there have been a lot, a lot of us kind of having those conversations on social media but also in the background so I would say that's that's got to be the way the campaign co goes on. And Claire, I mean, do you, do you feel that um, that you cannot actually get involved in any of that because you are meant to be fairly apolitical? Um, uh, That's because you've been put your podcasting. <laughs> 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 it's been different. It's going on I mean, everywhere on, on everywhere. Live, live stream, so uh, you can't say exactly what you want to say. Okay, I mean, what I'll say, we. Oh come on! It, it's the it's not a secret that over the last year. Uh, I was very uh, involved with lots of different groups trying to get opinions and, and see how we're all working together, all working, as you've said, uh, in parallel with each other, but along the same value system and along the same lines. So, uh, and you know, it's clearly going to continue in some shape. The other thing is, I'm a GP, and the one thing about a GP is that we we're generalists, so we, we tend to flit around, usually about every nine to ten minutes. And so we get into lots of places and we talk to lots and lots and lots of different people. And the Royal College of GPs does that. I mean, we, we were one of the only groups that were getting people together. So we had a meeting, not at, some, at one point during the, the debate, of a folk who'd never been round a table together, ever, ever, people drawn from health. But not from the traditional medical rural colleges, but from the other groups of, of health who had never sat round a table in, in 60 years. Well, you know, how ridiculous. But, but the joy of what was going on was that we were getting people together because we were all uh, concerned about the same issue. And that will carry on uh, because it has to carry on. But, we, but in what way now? I mean, now that, I mean, to a certain extent, I can see that the NHA party would has a role to play but what i mean and i suppose to, to a certain extent unison can do a lot of stuff locally what exactly would uh, the royal college of gps be able to do now well one of the main things that we're looking at is for example the issue about asking ccgs to sign a declaration to say that first they when they looking at commissioning they must first do no harm now that was something that i think was <laughs> floating around the bma we've certainly try to get it as part of our agenda. So there are things that the college can do is to, is to, is to continuously, uh, one is to tell the truth, to actually not have any rhetoric, to say, and you know, I know this is a big podcast, but not many GPs want to do this. This isn't something that GPs have been clamoring for to be involved in commissioning. They didn't want to do it under GP fund holding. They didn't want to do it under practice-based commissioning, and they're certainly not falling over themselves to get involved under uh, under this new bill. We also will continue to raise concerns about what's going on. Uh, at the moment, any of you that have been to your GP practice recently, we're not playing golf at the weekends. We're heaving under the workload. And we're raising concerns about that because paralleling this enormous reorganization, this pointless reorganization, is the most monumental a change in ter it cuts in what we're seeing on the frontline care, translating into <laughs> longer waits for your doctor, less services, less choice, etc. So we are pushing and telling people this at every opportunity. So we're not we're not a campaigning organisation. We're an organisation that's a cuddly Royal College, which is there to speak the truth for our patients. And Cl Clive, how do you see? Um your uh, party plugging into, I mean, you, you're partly, you're a doctor as well, aren't you? Yeah. And so you've got a lot of people from within the professional there who, who've got, to a certain extent, be apolitical. I don't know how they're going to be able to deal with the fact that they're apolitical, but also joining a political party, which is, um, you know, how, so how, firstly, how are you going to be able to bridge that gap between people who are from within the profession who cannot, I don't suppose, take political sides to be able to deal with this issue? And secondly, how do you see yourself plugging into some of the other uh, groups here. Uh, yeah, thanks Sonny. Uh, I think there are issues for some doctors in terms of being political and we've talked about the, you know, the colleges for example, but, but even at that level, um, you know, college presidents are potentially uh, political. Um, it's interesting that actually the Royal College of Surgeons, which was probably the only college um, that was not you know, completely anti the bill, they weren't for the bill by the way, 
uh, but uh, out of 20 colleges, they were the only college that didn't sign to withdraw the bill or ask for withdrawal in its, its current form. But e even, even amongst that college, their <coughs> pre previous incumbent, Bernie Ribeiro, is now a Tory Lord, um, and even who voted for the bill. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, so even at that level, you know, politics comes into it. But politics always comes into healthcare. You know, health is right at the part of our society. And if you look at the social determinants of, of, of health, that affects all sorts of aspects. And that's why we will, over time, not just be potentially a single issue party, which is one of the criticisms, because social determinants are deeply related to you know, economics, poverty, uh, things like fuel poverty, for example, has huge effects on health, uh, you know, transport, um, education, all those sorts of things um, we can eventually form policy on. So, um, you know, doctors can get involved um, and we do need that voice. Um, it's just a way to do it and I think we have to be political. We need a political party to defend the National Health Service. I think this has been missing for uh, a long time. Um, I think that all three political parties have let down the National Health Service, especially the coalition government, and I think this is a long-term vision because the National Health Service is a collectivist system and that it will always be under attack by the right because the, the right and those people that believe in free markets, that's the antithesis of you know, free market economics, collectivism, collectivism, and that's why the NHS has been under attack for 30 years. Um, but what, just sorry, just to interject there, where, uh, why is Labour not fulfilling the need, um, or where, do you, where would you see that Labour is failing on this issue? Um, well, I think that Labour started to fail, actually, uh, because of what Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan did um, in the 1980s, where they deregulated the financial industry. So what you have now is, is capital all around the world in this sort of new, in this neoliberal world that we've had, had in the last 30 years. Capital will go to whichever countries uh, where it will get the most return. So it will go to low tax economies, low inflation economies. So how do you get a low tax system? Well, you have to cut spending. You roll back the state. How do you prevent uh, inflation? Well, you, the most important thing to do is stop wage inflation. So what do you do? You, you crush the unions. That's why Thatcher and Reagan, Reagan crushed the unions. Um, and because capital can go anywhere in the world, we've now lost our national sovereignty. And that's why New Labour, uh, Labour became New Labour. We lost our national sovereignty to, to the bond markets and the financial sector. So uh, that, that's what we've seen in the sure. past you know, but, 13 years. But what I mean is in terms of their stance on the NHS bill, they've said they would repeal it. I mean, if you're going to stand kind of, I mean, I'm just being playing devil's advocate here. If I was uh, a person who wanted to see the bill repealed, um, surely I would then say, well, Labour's got more chance of going in than the new party. So what would you offer them and say to them, no, actually, you should vote for us rather than uh, at the Labour Party, which have also said that they would repeal the bill? I think that's a really important question. Um, what I would play on is uh, the, the, the Tories have said, and the Liberal Democrats in coalition, there'll be no top-down reorganisation of the NHS. And we kept repeating that and repeating that, and we need to do that ad finitum. In the same way, the Labour Party have said, we're going to repeal the Act. And we need to be repeating that, and we need to you know, send that political message out. Every time they're on, a, on a, you know, a debate with us, we will say, well, you said you've repealed the Act. You will repeal the Act. So uh, we can pressurise them uh, constantly on that. So that would be one of the things that our party would do. But we don't necessarily want to you know, damage the Labour Party. Um, the Labour Party, if they are saying they're going to repeal the Act, that is the party that in, in reality is the one that will in future defend the National Health Service. So that is why we have to be careful not to underm undermine the progressive vote. And that is one of the things that people are fearing about our party and say, well, you're going to split the pro progressive vote. You're just going to put the you know, Conservatives back into power. But you know, we are going to target seats carefully. Uh, we're not seeking to be a party of power. We're not going to stand in every constituency. We may see anywhere between sort of 30, maybe 100. We don't know how many par prospective parliamentary candidates we're going to get yet. So this is all to be decided. But like I say, we have a, a PhD in cephalology on our executive committee, and we are going to spend an awful amount of time you know, looking at seats and uh, making sure that, that whatever we do, we're going to defend the NHS and public services in general. So we're going to be very careful how this is, this is all done. And the other thing we'll do is we're going to hopefully get the NHS 
as the number two issue at the next general election, because that will damage the coalition hugely. It's obviously going to be the economy number one issue, but if we get NHS number two, that could be a really important thing politically. Uh, Tim, question for you. Um, would you mobilise people within the UK and CART to help a political party like that? Um, well, that's an interesting question. <laughs> that's what I'm here for. <laughs> Um, well, UK Uncut has historically been non-party political and it's really about particular issues. It starts off obviously around the cuts, so it's about campaigning against austerity and against the unfair and just and necessary cuts. It's not up for me to decide or like what UK Uncut activists do, what people involved in the movement do. Um, I think what is necessary to happen is that there needs to be a clear alternative, a clear anchor that progressive movements can fight on. Uh, that would be something that people would support together as an alliance, because obviously you can cut as a network works together with other groups. We don't work necessarily towards something. So for example, if Clive's party was proposing something that was generally towards a progressive end that seem to be proposing an alternative to cuts and a better type of NHS than is currently being proposed on the health and social care bill and that is something we could promote. I don't know how necessary direct action could be done in that way but like I think that's an important question because there was like a there's an opinion poll done earlier in the year in March uh, of people asking their opinion on the NHS health and social care bill uh, by YouGov and it said that 50 percent of the population in the UK oppose it. 14 I think it was 14 percent um, support it, and then 38% don't know. They didn't know. So I think for our movements, for NHS campaigners, um, that might be because they're not sure what the alternative is or what. I, I, we we, we want to reject the health and social care bill for several reasons, but what we're going to put in place that's going to make a better, more successful, more modern, useful, well-funded, excellent NHS. And I think that's where maybe, that's where I think um, social movements who aren't experts on these subjects, but generally have a good idea of what's fair, can really benefit from hearing from expert and health professionals' opinions, um, and then fight with them for those kind of causes. All right, I'll take that as a maybe, maybe not, um, in response to my question. <laughs> Okay, we're going to try and open it up so that uh, you can get also yes. join in. But uh, you know, let's have a discussion. But please don't uh, take too long uh, in uh, raising points. So let's try and be brief as much as possible. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Martin Rathfeld from the Social Health Association. When we were fighting the bill, there were a lot of people going around saying that the sky was going to fall and the National Health Service would be abolished when the bill was passed, and it has passed. And the NHS has not, as far as most of the population are concerned been abolished. Furthermore, when I read my health service journal this week, it tells me that Hinchinbrook Hospital, which has been given to the private sector to run, has done best in the staff survey of, when they asked all the staff of the entire NHS, would you recommend the place where you work for your friends and relations to come to be treated? Hinchinbrook did top. If we are still saying that the NHS is coming to an end, how can we convince the public? Good question. I think you would probably start off by saying it's not going to happen immediately. Um, you know, it, it will take a bit of time, but I mean, what would you say to that, Sean? I think it has been one of the lessons that we've learned from the campaign around the Health Act was that the day after the bill went through, the NHS still existed. So we need to be looking at our messaging. And actually, some of that messaging is is maybe more it's about it, the, the end, the, the national is being taken out of our national health service. And what does fragmentation, you know, we use these words like fragmentation and privatisation, and those of us who live and breathe health policy know what that means and know what that means for the health service. So how do we get that? message over to the public. Why does it matter to the public? If they, work in, they walk into a hospital that has NHS but actually it's run by Virgin, what difference does it make to them if they're still getting a free and comprehensive health care? And I think we need to start getting that message across about actually this is behind that, that this is what this means, this is what it means for the staff, this is what it's doing to staff morale which will have an 
impact on patient care. The attacks that are going on for Agenda for Change at the moment are all to do with that fragmentation. So it's more about taking the na N out of the National Health Service that, and what and that getting that messaging across is, I think, one of the real complexities. We've tried to do it through, you know, we had the Andrew Lansby rap 18 months ago, a rapper did it much better than any of us ever did it. Um, we also then had, you know, we've had this new, uh, new NHS film that we did, which was a bit of a spoof, but actually it was, this is what it could be like. And, you know, only today on Twitter, it was being said that I think one of the, they were, they were often health insurance top-ups. And stuff. So I think it's about how do we, in clear, simple language, get the message across saying there will still be a national health service, but you won't be able to get X, Y, and Z on it anymore. You might not, you know, you'll need insurance to have it topped up. You'll need it could go like the American system. <coughs> so it's that simple. Oh, but again, it's probably, and that simple messaging across to the people in a way that they understand because there is still a national health service, but it's not as we know it anymore. I would just be very simple and actually say, look at other models, look at social care. When we were all children, our social care, there was one provider, the state of social care. There are now around 32,000 providers of social care, including some micro providers. Look at what the market has done to social care. We have bankruptcies like Southern Cross. We have massively increased costs for social care, and we have uh, complaints about social care almost on a daily basis. So I would just say, of course there isn't a big bang. It's an experiential, it's a process, but just look at the examples that we've got elsewhere. And uh, again, briefly, uh, I'd echo what my colleagues have said there. Uh, I mean, what happened overnight when the Act was passed is actually we went from having an in English National Health Service to an English Health Service. That's what we've got. So the, the fundamental legal basis of the NHS has been abolished. Um, but as Oliver Letwin said a few years back, um, you know, within five years, he said, you know, the NHS will be completely changed uh, uh, and, you know, increasingly privatised. And that's why I use the term increase, increasing privatisation. There'll never be full privatisation of the National Health Service because pr the private sector doesn't want that because not all the services that are provided are pr profitable. So we're going to shrink down to you know, an, an, an NHS core service, a minimal sort of safety net, if you like. Uh, that's a lot of what the, 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 the £20 billion quip efficiency savings were, were about, actually brought in under new labour, but driven by M M McKinsey. Uh, because what that does, if you've got a successful health service that's properly funded, it cr crowds out the private sector. The private sector cannot be effective. So what you actually have to do is make the NHS fail. So we are seeing it failing. Actually, we're seeing waiting lists go up significantly. Um, we're, we're seeing problems around the place with PFI, um, uh, it's financial collapse of hostels uh, down in London. And that will see increasing stories over time. Um, but because it happens incrementally, the public don't see it straight away and it becomes irreversible over time and we get EU competition law, all these sorts of legal aspects, um, it becomes a, you know, really, really dangerous and that's why we have to set up our political party quickly and we have to make an impact at the next election, otherwise if the coalition get in again next time around, then the NHS really could, it could be the end of the NHS in the long term and be completely irreversible. Um, yeah, this gentleman here.
really should you make a play on things like the yeah, deep breast implant issues? Mm-hmm. Say, come on. I, I think it, uh, the, the cynic in me thinks that having that language uh, or translating that to the ordinary public is going to be slightly difficult. Um, so I, I suppose the, the language the, is wrong, but the story. Yeah, no, you're right. Can I just say the physiotherapists have been fantastic. A real hidden, uh, not hidden in the way, but. The, your college and your leaders have been absolutely fantastic in the whole and trying to get the message out. Where the message comes in is when your previous president of the college said to me, there's 30 different providers of physiotherapy currently in Nottingham. Okay, 30. And she said, not even she would know which one to go to, mm-hmm. let alone the public which one to go to. So this nonsense about people choosing on some sort of quality agenda when not even the leader of the profession would know how to choose out of those. So I think, you know, there are messages to come out, but it, you're right, they have to be simple. Because I spoke to a load of GPs the other night, and one of them came up to me and said, oh, and very sheepish, she said, I didn't understand any of the issues of the bill. Thank you for explaining them now, because it's complicated stuff. Not even politicians knew. It was easy to, to, to talk to politicians and to get within five seconds to the <coughs> point of their knowledge, not in a horrible way, but you know, you'd start talking about what's the difference in, in any qualified provider and, and, and requirement to tender and they wouldn't know. So this is complicated stuff and I don't think we should oversimplify it because it is complicated stuff and I, I think on the one hand we should make it understandable but you know, there is a lot going on out there. It's true. Um, gentleman in the back there. Yeah. Uh, uh, Charlie Mansell. Um, for my sins, I'm a chair of the uh, constituency Labour Party. Interestingly, it's uh, a small constituency Labour Party, but happens to also have Paul Burstow as the uh, Liberal Democrat in the area. So I uh, uh, wanted to ask Clive a question, actually, because we, uh, we've heard <coughs> of uh, some sort of health candidate uh, running in our area. Um, uh, I mean, obviously with Paul Burstow, I mean, he's the person, as you know, who didn't read the first draft of the NHS bill, which is why it's had to be rewritten again, and it's still not very good. But uh, Martin's wrong in saying that people aren't noticing the NHS bill, because obviously in our neck of the woods, St. Helier Hospital has been identified as a place where the accident and emergency has been taken away, so people can immediately see where the bill has led to. Um, what I wanted to ask Clive was, um, I'm glad to see that you've got a, 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 a psychologist who's doing some analysis and presumably working at the seat selection, but are you going to be engaging with members of the public, uh, potentially other stakeholders, including, you know, you know, I'm very happy to talk to, you know, to other uh, parties and things like that, uh, to work out where you're going to stand. Because in the end, obviously, we'll be running a candidate ourselves. We are campaigning on the, the issue of fighting St. Helio Hospital. But obviously, if someone suddenly comes with a top-down agenda saying, oh, I'm going to be standing as an NHS action party or whatever, it's all very nice for some outsider coming in. How are you going to determine your process for, for example, identifying whether there's demand, engaging with the local community, rather than simply having a meeting somewhere in central London and saying, we're going to fight 50 seats or whatever? Just before you... Um before Clive gets into that, just a quick question. John, is there any uh, microphones going around for the questions, just in case for next time, because um, some people on the live stream have said that they can't hear the oh, questions okay. being asked, so um, just keep that in mind for next time. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really important uh, question. I mean, at this stage, we're not even sure how many candidates, uh, and you know, in terms of prospective parliamentary candidates, are, are, are going to stand. I mean, hopefully as, 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 as many as possible. We're clearly going to have to have uh, discussions. I mean, that's the way you know politics has, has got to work. There are other political parties that support the NHS uh, very deeply. They would argue, like you know, the Green Party, for example, they've got very good um, policies on the National Health Service. So um, they, they, they may have issues with us, um, and we, do, we don't want to harm uh, the opportunities for other you know political parties um, who feel they might be able to defend the NHS. I mean, our, our argument is that uh, after we announced that we were going to uh, set up a political party in the Sunday Independent with that letter, uh, I don't know if you saw, but Lord Ashcroft um, did a poll uh, which was published on Conservative Home uh, and asked the voters who they who they vote for. 
and um, we got 18% of the vote, and uh, that made me even more determined to go. I mean, that would put us in third place, so I was sort of flab flabbergasted by that. Third place, twice the Lib Dem vote, uh, you know, br br bring it on. Um, you know, they, they should be asking to negotiate with us uh, rather than us, uh, you know, going to speak with them. But, you know, that's one poll, and, you know, we have to take it with a you know, a certain pinch of salt. Um, we're not going to take that for granted in any way. And quite a bit of that vote was coming from, uh, as he argued in his piece, from, from, from Labour supporters. That's how it was, how it was set across. Um, but absolutely, we need to be dis discussing, and it's going to be a lot of, um, you know, discussions at our executive committee meetings uh, and with prospective candidates about how we're going to do this. We've got to think it through extremely carefully. There's a lot of people worried about us on all sides of the political spectrum. So um, it is important to get that absolutely spot on and we'll do our best to ensure that. Uh, gentleman there. Uh, yeah. Oh, hello. Uh, I'm Hal from Lewis from Keeper NHS Public. A couple of very brief points. Privatisation never affects people overnight. Just look at rail privatisation. Nothing changed overnight, but where are we at 20 years later with the most expensive rail fares, if not in the world, certainly Europe. And look at the 1988 Housing Act. No more building of council houses. Why are people in London paying £500 a month to rent one room in a house? It's because they got rid of fair rent officers. And so my point about the NHS is thus. The profits will be going to Virgin and not the patients. Those are the kinds of arguments we need to be having to people, with people. And it will create a two-tier health service with 49% of NHS beds full of private patients. Just look at the United States. And then, of course, the £10 billion increase in the administration costs under the new Health and Social Care Act. And I'd like to not sound too factionalist here, but I must raise this with the Unison rep. I have to ask the Unison rep why it is that Unison failed to print on at least four occasions leaflets for protests leading up to the Health and Social Care Bill, in, to the extent that when Unite called an action, uh, Dave Prentice... Uh, refused to back the action on the basis that it was called by Unite and not the TUC and we simply can't afford this division and so where was the national protest for the health service and so we've got one in October now and we need to come together and build that and my final point is that one of the reasons I'm here they've got a load of people together, well a load, nine people <laughs> who want to work together online to raise the protest and presence for the national health service I'm obviously part of Lewisham KMP, we have a website and so on if anyone here is interested that we can really coordinate and come together, whether that's through a chat room, a forum, or something like that, so that we can all coordinate together, so we're all singing from the same hymn sheet. Thank you. Um, okay, Sean, do you want to answer some of those questions? Um, with regard, um, I'm not sure which uh, national protest you are talking about. We have worked together for the last two years with all together for the NHS. The TUC has worked together. We've been brought together with Unite and other colleagues, and we have all been working very well over the last two years. So I think the fact that, you know, one of the things that is incredibly frustrating is when we all start turning on each other. That's not what's needed at the moment. We will continue to work together like we have done for the last two years. There is a national demonstration on the 20th of October, and I would hope that, you know, one of the things that we do all say, and there's a practical, pragmatic thing from this, um, from today is that we go out and organize as much as possible we had half a million people on the 26th of March last um, last year and we need at least a million on the 20th of October and at least half of those million need to be stood there saying the reason why they're there is because of what's going on with the National Health Service so that is one of the big messages well and we are all working together we you know we're all talking to each other all the time I can't say this enough you know there's a number of times we are talking to each other and stuff so the, the demonstration that you're talking about, and Dave Prentice, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm unsure what that was about, and I think that's miscommunication, so I just want to make it very clear. You know, we worked with you, Unite on the national rally on the 7th of March. We worked uh, with Unite on all the local action. We worked very closely with Labelling, and actually one of the things that was really effective of this campaign was that we made it felt at a local level those MPs and those peers that actually started supporting us felt it at a local level and that was a decision that was made 
by um, the All Together for the NHS campaign, but also other campaign groups, we had to be make this felt at a local level, and that's why we had over a, a 18 months period, we had at least 200 local activities going on, and we need to continue that local mobilisation up until you know the next election in full October the 20th. So you know we've got to continue that local mobilisation because that is ultimately where the MPs need to feel it. Basically, any MP that voted for this bill needs to, we need to make sure, as a progressive movement, they don't get in again, and we make them feel it. We made them feel those people, I get very passionate about this, sorry, but we made people feel it in that, you know, we made the NHS an election issue in the local elections. We need to make sure that we continue to keep it on the election. Um, on the kind of the set, you know, I would like it to be number one when the election issues comes up because what this government wants is it for all to be put under the carpet, and we have to keep that pressure up at a local level. Yeah, the lady there. mission are you working together how much coordination is there is there some cohesiveness um, between the professional bodies but also people like keep the NHS public I'm trying to sort of figure out where you fit in with all that and I'm partly trying to do that because I want to try and figure out what I as a citizen could I just come here as a patient and a citizen who is appalled by what's happened to the NHS and want to do something but I really don't want to join a party I'd, I don't want to join any of the parties but I would very much like to help your party in a sort of focused and targeted way. And so will there be space for people who want to be involved as patients and citizens uh, because we think you may be representing something that is really, really good, really helpful? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, thank, thank you for that. I mean, we, we certainly uh, recognize, uh, you know, the issues of, you know, healthcare professionals running a, you know, a political party. And, you know, in the media, it said it's going to be all doctors. And that, that certainly isn't necessarily going to be the case. Um, we had some nurses and other healthcare professionals sign our letter, for example. We're keen to be inclusive. Uh, we we do have some, you know, potential tensions, though. This is the other potential problem with a party that I've already thought about, is that potentially you've got quite a technocratic party in terms of you've got healthcare professionals who are, you know, you know, experts in the sort of health area. So we're going to win the health arguments. I think quite convincingly at the, the next election uh, and we've got credibility with the public on those areas. As soon as you ex start expanding out your policy agenda into other areas, which I feel we probably do need to do to increase your credibility, actually then, then you, become, you can become you know, uh, you know, more at risk to criticism. But uh, I'm very keen to be you know, open and democratic in, in terms of the, the membership and people who want to uh, uh, you know, apply to, you know, to be prospective parliamentary candidates. So if we've got you know, patients or citizens who uh, want to get involved, uh, uh, we, they will go through the, the, you know, potentially the same process for uh, you know, prospective parliamentary candidate selection if they want to apply. I think we really need to open it. Oh, absolutely. We're going to need people to plod the streets. We're going to need people to leaflet. We're going to need people to donate money. Uh, we're going to need you know, people to you know, get behind us. Uh, we, we can't do anything unless we've got a lot of people behind us. But this is a very good point you make because there are lots of groups. Last Saturday, who was at the meeting at Friends House last Saturday? Yeah, so a lot of us were at the meeting Friends House, which again was a superb meeting bringing together very disparate, uh, not disparate as in desperate, but different groups from right across uh, the spectrum and, you know, and, and the debates were very interesting to look at a coordinated uh, campaign and somebody from 38 Degrees made a very, very good comment which was that actually maybe it works better without having a single organisation who's, who's driving the, the issues because one is it becomes so clunky you would end up having to get agreement you know, very, and it, getting agreement from lots of organisations takes a lot of time. The second is, I think as long as there's synergy, each brings its own individual ability to do what it does. And you've already said you couldn't have did, done what 38 degrees, you couldn't do what UK mm -hmm. can't do. We certainly couldn't do some of the stuff. So as long as there's communication, and the social media sites, believe me, for me, has been the, the most fantastic, because you just see what's going on, and, and you know who to touch into. Money is needed, and certainly uh, your party will need money. Keep our NHS public. Does it on a shoestring. You know, they, they have a constant 
clamour for money, give them some money. I haven't said that really, but you know what I mean. <laughs> so, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's not going on on the internet, I promise you. Um, uh, Shibli, you have a question, don't you? And then go up behind you. Keep it short and sweet. Thanks, Sunny, for uh, helping given for facilitating this discussion all the time. You've done a great job. I'd just, just like to make a few points which are important. In English law, the purpose of the company is to maximize shareholder dividend. I don't want to go over this argument again, but it's really important. Now, as for the doctors, uh, being in a party, be mindful of the GMC. They will be very mindful of not wanting to undermine trust in the reputation of medicine. So you're obviously uh, treading a very fine line there. I want to come on to, uh, I'm not saying you are, but I'm saying a Houston word uh, can go and follow Catherine. And I want to come on to the management issues very briefly. Uh, I understand from my own MBA in change management that the only way you can implement strategic change is to have full follower support. I really don't know what McKinsey is talking about. Uh, and I understand from the St. Andrew's Place physicians that at least I am ambivalent about the NHS ad. Uh, I don't know what their position is. I understand they had a vote. Um, and also, uh, the unison, the classic case in point, uh, how McKinsey should have implemented this was to have focus groups um, as a massive strategic change that should have involved the world colleges, including surgeons, and the unions, <coughs> and the public from where to go. As it is, I would have done my life on the date that the strategic change will fail, which brings me on to Claire and Clive's positioning on this is crucial. You'll have to make a decision whether you are actually outright wanting to repeal it or whether you just want to enact it somehow with minimal damage to the stakeholders. And I said that's a cautionary tell because I believe that one-term governments are not that common. Mm. I'll leave to that. So I, I suppose you, the point you're trying to make is if the, the Conservative Party do get back into power, what position does that put us in, um, in terms of... Um, <laughs> yeah. We'll be fighting for our lives on the NHS. Yeah, there is, there is that. But, um, yeah, I mean, Claire, I mean, I suppose this, this, this comes fun. down to you to a certain extent. I mean, even to um, Sean, because... If you can't find it, uh, fight it on a national level, which is repealing the bill, a lot of the work will have to be done locally, won't it? Um, you know, and so you have been running some campaigns locally yeah. on that. I mean, do you mind telling us what campaigns you I think run and how would they work? One of the benefits has been of the local campaigning. So we work very closely um, with um, our Labour Link team and we targeted a group of MPs and peers and we did a lot of local campaign and I think one of the things is that we need to make sure that that local campaigning uh, continues and one of the things I would say to anyone who he says I'm just a citizen I'm not in a union I'm not in a labor party is find out what's going on at your local level and if there isn't a local uh, kind of group around this then set one up do that local campaign because again this is where it, it, it will be felt and it's about us all working as a community not just it can't be driven from just the national level it's got to be felt at that local level and there's lots of us who work at a local level as well you know there's local rcgp people that you know we could link you up with there's people from socialist health association keep our nhs public so also you just need to kind of find out who those people are and get them to start talking to each other and sort of saying i want to get involved and that's what happened very much over the last 18 months, two years. We just said to people, next Saturday, we need, sorry, next Saturday, we need as many people out on the streets at a local level, leafleting and letting the, local, <laughs> letting the local community um, know what's going on. And that's what people did. And we just said, look, here's some templates of leaflets that you can use, print them off and go and do that. If you need stuff, print it off and go and do it. And people did that. And that's how all those petitions were signed and stuff. And I think also, how we, you know, 
how we mobilise those local people is a really important issue, and I think it will become even more important if the, you know, it, it just frightens us to think if the Tories do get back in, because I think at that point we are really, you know, we thought this was a fight. If the Tories get back in, you know, we, it just. Yeah, I mean, yeah. but I think for, for us, and I, I would, you know, we are a Labour affiliated union, and I think also some of our thing is that we need to make sure that we are for us, and you know, Unison has said this, and Dave Prentice said this in his speech last week. I know um, Len McClusty said this in his Unite speech. Is also for us, we need to make sure that our Labour Party keeps to repealing the bill and actually that you know and people can say well, but that's something that we need to be making sure as well as a progressive movement we keep them accountable we need to make sure the Labour Party stick to that and actually you know they, they, they do say that the NHS is a preferred provider and there is a big uh, piece of work going on at the moment where Labour is setting its health policy and we are very involved in that and making sure that Labour sticks to the health policy that patients and the left want and we continue to want, and I think we have to keep that pressure on as well, is actually, you know, um, and it's the same also, there's a huge link with what's going on with public health and local councillors and stuff. They're going to have a massive influence on the NHS and on, on the health of people that in a way that never happened before. So we have to keep those people and to accountable as well. Can I make a quick comment on this, Sunny? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I just wanted to say that something we found quite useful, I mean, we've heard a couple of comments about how you get people involved and get local issues up the political agenda and known locally. And so what we've done is we've actually gone to the source of people who are actually suffering from the cuts, who are actually going to be, you know, at the cold face of these uh, cuts, and worked with um, disabled people, disabled activists and health activists, who then take direction, direct action themselves and that the anger and the appetite for these kind of actions is very high. People want to be involved directly, participating, getting things done, getting stuck in and doing things themselves. So what we've tried to get people to do is like negotiate, find about, the, about their issues and then find like really like high profile, confrontational targets that really like you can't ignore, that are so vocal and visible you have to t start talking about it. And so we've done actions, for example, with disabled people against the cuts at Oxford Circus, where they chain themselves to block traffic. We did a similar kind of demo with healthcare workers outside the House of Commons. And these, these uh, uh, tactics got us national and local coverage. And with hospital closures locally, dramatizing that um, confrontation between uh, the public sector getting attacked and the private, uh, private companies really profiting, there is a clearly a dramatic tension there that can be exploited. But, and I think that, that there's an underused resource of the patients there who could really be used to be uh, dramatizing that and speaking out. And that's what people really want to hear. And that's how we can really get our message across more. So taking, taking action where we are locally is really important, I think. I just wanted to uh, come in quickly in terms of our role. Um, although we'll be sort of targeting seats, um, the most important thing that we can do is actually get out there and tell the truth about what's going on. That is the key thing. Because as soon as you start targeting seats, you can get criticised, oh, you're, you're, just, you're just splitting votes. I know, OK, tactically, we admit we will need to do that. But actually, the key thing we're going to be doing is getting out the message there that is actually what's really happening to the, to, to the health service and what's been going on. And essentially, the public has been lied to. Uh, I mean, I'm not got any problems with saying that they've been lied to. Uh, the government said there'd be no top-down reorganisation. They said there would be no privatisation. And actually, the WHO definition of privatisation uh, fits in with what's going on with the bill. Uh, it, by international definitions of privatisation, uh, it's all fulfilled by the Health and Social Care Act. I've, I've published a paper on it in the British Medical Journal. So uh, we've been lied to. And actually, uh, this is what the underlying political doctrine of the last 30 years leads to is political lying and that's why we've seen you know the spin from the, the new labor for example because what they're actually doing they can't tell the public and they can't even tell their own MPs and that's why new labor triangulated all the arguments it was called triangulation that's what Bill Clinton did with the Democrats as well uh, so they reframe the whole the debate and um, in the probably famous words of Karl Rove we make up our own truths now and that's what they're doing and if we get these messages out loud and clear what is happening, the public won't stand for it. And that is what 
you know, my profession, with the exception of Claire and a few others, failed to do. Uh, the leadership of the medical profession, I think, uh, you know, let down uh, the public. Um, uh, the, the, the voice of patients let down the public. The patients Association, other organisations that are quite happy to criticise doctors, I'm happy to criticise them back. I, I did my fair share for the NHS. So, uh, you know, all of these organisations, uh, you know, need to come out and we need to get a united voice and actually, you know, do that. And that's what our party is aimed at doing. Can I just say something? Yep. I, uh, I, everywhere I go, I sort of, because I'm, I, I can't do what you're doing because I'm an apolitical organisation, but I try and get the same message out and I notice Brian's it because it's very difficult for my profession, for GPs, because... I genuinely, and I've said this many times, I genuinely don't think my profession knows what they're being asked to do. Mm. And I get sometimes quite angry at them. So I've gone out with the same messages. And if you want to Google my NHS Confederation talk last week, which I talked to the, the NHS managers, well, I gave some, some honest feedback. But I think for my profession, they've got to be, number one, they've got to understand what they're being asked to do. They've got to, be, they've got to un, be, understand that they're being asked to decommission and they're being asked to take on the work that our politicians should be doing, i.e. rationing. Now, everybody says to me, of course GPs ration. I say they don't ration. They prioritise according to need. Our politicians are the ones that have to say how many hospitals we need. Of course we can help them, but it's our politicians that determine whether we need neonatal cots or wheelchairs, not GPs, any more than my bus driver. These are decisions that have to be made through an accountable system. So that's number two. Number three, my profession absolutely 100% have to speak out when they see inequalities and unfairness happening, which is happening all the time. And they have to speak out. They can't hide behind, oh, but we're doing this because we're being asked to do it. And finally, my profession have to watch their language. I cannot bear that how easy and quickly doctors are moving into the language of the market. And again, I spoke about this at my conference 2011, 2011 last year, so you can Google that. How many times do we hear about doctors calling patients customers? Oh, for God's sake, who's a customer here when you go and have your cervical smear? Oh, come on. I'm a customer when I go and buy my bag of crisps. Frequent flyers, <coughs> risk stratification. Just listen to the language and listen how eat choice. Where did choice suddenly... I, I looked up the NHS Constitution. Choice doesn't really figure in the NHS Constitution. It certainly doesn't figure in Bevan uh, when he talks about choice. But it's so easy now. Everybody talks about choice as if somehow it's always it, you're clamouring for choice. So that's what my profession, you doctors in the room, you've got to find this. It, I'm a lone voice out there more or less. It's, it's lonely out there constantly having to, 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 to sh stand up and, and face my profession and say what nonsense you're speaking and, and get back into the consulting room and, and sort it out in the consulting room. So, can I also, I think, sort of to go with that as well, I think we all have responsibility as patients. Forget that I'm, um, you know, a member of Unison. The reason why I did this campaign was because of the impact it would have as me, Sean Rabilale, a, a service user. That's why, you know, and we have to get that message out. And I think that's one of the things that was so great about this campaign and the use of social media and bringing it back to, you know, how do we use that online campaigning? Because for a long time, this wasn't hitting the front pages, but there was a momentum growing on Twitter, on the social media networks that was starting to say that this bill was important. All the, you know, it was a huge campaign online. The petitions that was going on was all online and that was then resulting in local activity. So there's also an onus of, you know, if you are, if you're, if you're, patient if you're as a patient if you're suddenly having a long waiting time let the local press know get it out there get those patient stories out there because that is what we have got we haven't got made you know and that's the the whole there's so many of us against us get those patient stories online on blogs on twitter let the local papers know this is what's happening to me at a local level and let's start changing the kind of right wing media that was going on and that's what has happened and hopefully that will continue to happen because there was a real campaign going online and we need to continue that and get that patient voice heard more than anything. I definitely agree but all of the, a lot of the online campaigning was a bit uh, haphazard so 
I mean, uh, we had the e petition on the site, and there was, um, I mean, you know, Forbes Economy produced some fact sheets, and there was uh, the the peers, um, adopt a peer mm -hmm. stuff that you guys were doing. But it, it seems to me it's slightly, maybe not confusing, but it's difficult for people to know. Uh, what what campaigns are going on right now? Online campaigns. So I mean, I wonder if there's a space where, on a, a on a website, if you're not a, a, a you're not a person who is going out there pounding the streets, you can see what online campaigns or what online actions um, you can take right now. And, and am I alone in thinking that there isn't some space right now? I mean, <coughs> we, do you think that unions, to a certain extent, should do that too? I mean, I mean, they did do some of it, but see, it felt like it was either housed just on the Unison website or housed at the Unite website. And, and there doesn't seem to be one website where you could go to and say, bang, do this, number two, do this, number three, do, do that. There was different, so, you know, there was stuff that was going on with 38 Degrees, there was stuff on the TUC website. I would say there's probably, uh, I think I ended up, and I can talk from a personal point of view, is that there were five or six websites that I kept on visiting and I was finding out what's going on. But also yeah. there were, there's probably about, 15 or 20 people you need to follow on Twitter and it might be useful and one of the things maybe from Netroots is that we get that yeah. list of people sent round so you know no, no surprises I followed Clive and Claire and also, a better NHS what's his name uh, <laughs> yeah Johnny Tomlinson I, I, follow, I followed you know what, whatever the, the guy who was pretending to be Andrew Lansley <laughs> which is brilliant La La Lansley mainly because he he really cheered us up you know um, people started following Guy and myself because we would at the Lib Dem conference, we were in the Lib Dem conference talking to the Lib Dems around what was going on there, and then we were able to send stuff out on Twitter so that people were then starting to lobby the Lib Dems, which was a very surreal um, position that we were in and stuff. So there are people. So I think what it would be useful is maybe, and that might be something, and I'm looking at John at the back there as I'm saying this, is something that could come out of net roots. Because I think one thing I'm really conscious of is um, we do a lot of talking about this stuff. And for me, I'd really like some pragmatic, practical stuff. Even if it's just that we say, let's send around a list of who you should follow on Twitter, what websites you should be going, because then at least we are all talking to each other online in a way. Mm. And that's one of the things I think that's great about Netroots is that it's bringing people to have those online conversations and know who to, who to follow, who to, which websites to check, you know, false economy, um, Liberal conspiracy, the Unison one, there was a TUC one, there was the Socialist Health Association. But I live and breathe this stuff. This is my job, and I think we need to make, yeah. you know, it's what I do, not 24 7, but it did feel like that at times. But I think for, for the norm, for the average citizen who's not a policy wonk like myself, needs to know I go there and who should I be following and how do I do that? And I think that is something we might need to make clearer within the campaign movement. And I'm looking at John as I'm saying that because that might be an action that we can take forward in networks. Done it. Done it. There we go. Brilliant. Thanks, John. <laughs> um, everything was that easy. <laughs> actually, following that question up, I, I mean, I, I, I want to ask a question of the audience, which is. What did you feel was, did you feel something was lacking or what did you feel was lacking in terms of uh, some of the online campaigning around the NHS bill in the past and what would you like to see more of? Um, and so maybe if you also felt that um, there wasn't one place that you could go to to find out what everything was going on. I mean, that, that bit's covered now and we're going to try and figure out how to deal with that. But I mean, do you have, does anyone have any of the thoughts on I was, I was making some points saying, why don't they say this, this, and this, and so, Sunny then gave me a link to a website, which made precisely the points I was making. So my point is, I think it would be useful just to have a page or something with these campaigns uh, made aware to me, because I keep myself fairly up to date with Twitter, but I'm, I'm not sure what the campaigns are in other. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, lady there. It'd be useful if you say what your name is and also what your Twitter name is, because there's lots of people in this room tweeting. <laughs> It'd be nice to know who you are. <laughs> um, Tori Dunn, and my Twitter name is Stradella. Um, I, this is actually not in direct answer to your question, I'm sorry. Um, but I wanted to ask if there are um, 
in addition to the large campaigns, the political campaigns, which I think you know are really, really crucial because basically we try to exert moral authority and those who didn't give a damn about the other than the 1% said, yeah, poof, you know. So, so obviously we need these bigger campaigns to change that p power base. But I'm wondering, um, and I was kind of a little bit um, inspired by looking at the UK Uncut legal brief and just thinking about the thing that happened in the US where they tried to overturn health care. I'm wondering if we could do the opposite, overturn the overturning of health care. And if anybody is looking at doing really big, substantive legal challenges to what's gone on. Good question. Are there any legal challenges happening to what the bill is doing? Uh, we did do one. We did one in October. I'm looking at it. Was thank you, thank you, Martin. We did. Uh, Unison took a judicial review in October 2010, and unfortunately, um, we did lo lose it. But actually, and there was a judgment around that, and there has been um, some. Uh, there has been some legal stuff still happening, but I think unfortunately that judicial review was taken out as soon as the white paper was learnt and we did lose it and it was, I think part of that was it was a new government and it was going to be a very brave judge who was going to come up against the government at that point um, but, and, and it is about, you know and I think there is some stuff that maybe we can be looking at legally but also it's about how we again um, and some of the conversations we've been having as well is how do we train people up in some of this stuff so is it, you know, if you look at what this act is like, how do people, knowledge is power, so those people who have the knowledge about how to, um, you know, I've forgotten it's the right to reply, is it the right to, there's a thing about you can challenge things about the health bill, sorry my brain has just sorry. gone. I'm, I'm not a lawyer. Yeah, there is, um, <laughs> sorry, so good. there's a really good, uh, our lawyers that we're using for that are called Lee Day & Co, and they've got a really good PDF, two page PDF on their website which talks about JRs and other legal avenues, um, we make it uh, so you can challenge legal. bodies which are making decisions, I, I wrote it down here because I thought it might come up, making decisions affecting and varying the provision of health services so that like basically like local um, bodies need to consult overview and scrutiny committees and local authorities and involve or consult service users and potential service users so this PDF basically goes through those processes and says if that's not being done what you can do Lee Day, L-E-I-G-H New Word Day I, 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 know, I know for a fact that there are some people who are, are actually sort of dr drafting you know other bills uh, which essentially repeal a, a lot of what's happening I think when Labour say they will repeal the Act, I think um, uh, you know there'll 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 need to be some leeway in in that interpretation. I think it's it's difficult for me to say that um, because you want to make the arguments. But actually, there are a few things that you could do to the Act that could you know completely crush um, increasing privatisation of the NHS. Um, you know, you, you, if you reinstate Clause One, for example, and you reinstate the duty of the Secretary of State to provide a comprehensive healthcare system and you say what, what that means clearly, uh, then you can't shrink the NHS down and just into core services. You know, that's something that could be reasonably straightforward. And if you take big chunks out of part three of the bill, which is all about introducing an external market and stop it being so market driven and you know privatised, then there are there are things you can do. So there's hope from that perspective. And the other just ten seconds to say there's lots of secondary legislation that's going to need to go through and that can all be challenged as well. So um, there's still hope um, and that's why we need to try and stop it as soon as possible before it becomes irreversible potentially. Uh, gentlemen here, we've got about five, ten minutes left, so if you could be quick and then leave it there. Uh, Sam Wheeler, my Twitter hashtag is uh, Sammy Kane, and Sonny might remember, I'm the um, Banksy model. Yeah. Um, I, what I really felt was actually missing from the debate was the 200 and odd Labour MPs who are meant to be the party that constantly goes on about the fact that they created the NHS and should have been consistently day in and day out saying the Tories are taking it away from you. We told you the Tories would take away from you. We've been telling you this for 60 years and now it's happening. And I think to some extent maybe because of the mix upon foundation hospitals, maybe because the, the party always seems to shrink into itself like it's been beaten up every time the Tories kick them out of power. It, that, there was just a, a sort of um, a failure to do that on their part. Um, 
But the, the, the flip side, because the, we did fail in the judicial review, but the flip side of it, of the sort of massive amount of parliamentary sovereignty we have in this country, is that you can undo it. If there's the political will there, you can undo it. And yes, you can end up running into EU competition law, but if you have the political will behind it, you can treat it in the same way that the French treat it when it comes to their farmers, same way the Germans treat it when it comes to their manufacturing industry. If you've got the political will behind it, you can actually get past this, and that's what needs to be created. And just a, a final quick thing, which is that I actually do have a friend who worked at McKinsey in the health sector at the time. And once I got past all the gunfire in the bar on one night, he asked him, what is this actually about? And he said, we are going to tell the hospitals to sack people and reduce services in order to save money. Just as 10 years ago, we told them to hire people and increase services when the money was plentiful. And that, at the heart of it, is all that they did. Yes. <laughs> Um, well, I mean, just the, the, the Labour Party hasn't exactly been that quiet on the NHS. I mean, even the I mean, the Labour leaders come out lots of times say we're going to repeal the bill. I mean, they were more rubbish when John Healy was leading the fight back against the NHS. But I think well, we criticised him quite strongly, and when Andy Burnham took over, they sort of became a bit more vocal about it. Part of the problem I feel that actually was that the media wasn't paying any attention. or didn't really care what the Labour Party was saying or doing. Um, and I saw that loads of times when they were giving massive speeches about repealing the bill, they didn't get any coverage. I mean, even The Guardian didn't bother covering them because they were just more interested partly because there was some discussion going on between the Lib Dems and the Tories. And so for them, it was more interesting to see the conflict between the coalition than it was to pay attention to what Lay Party was saying. And Lay Party wasn't that bad on it. I mean, even Healy was quite strongly against the bill. He just wasn't getting any airtime at all. Uh, Andy Burnham, to his credit, is a bit more savvy in terms of appealing uh, to the media and to the public, so he managed to do that. But, you know, they weren't entirely... I mean, the NHS is the one thing, actually, they weren't... I, th I think, personally, they weren't that bad on um, in terms of opposing the government. Um, the lady behind the gentleman here, and then I'll come back to you. And then. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry, thank you. I'm Ruth and I tweet as Unite LE 785. Um, it was really Sean's point about kind of telling stories about where there are cuts and what's happening. And is there a danger, I'm wondering, that, you know, the NHS was really, has been really popular and for most people it has directly saved the lives of, you know, at least one of their close friends or relatives. And it's, you know, I, there is huge popular support. Um, and what's happened in social care is obviously what will happen and people have huge confidence I think in in the NHS at the moment but we can see already that satisfaction levels have dropped quite dramatically and there is a fear given we've got a time lag before the next election I suppose my concern is uh, is that is it right to be worried that lots of stories about how people can't get involved with the GP anymore then when they do they have to wait six months before they get referred things get missed, the diagnosis isn't done properly, that's actually what we do is to devalue the NHS. People start to think, I'm going to have to pay for private health care because the NHS is rubbish. And how do we hold on to the NHS is the best model that's actually, it's structural, it isn't just about whether or not it's a bit better or it's customer focused, it's about the structure of the NHS being there for patient care, yeah. not for private profit. Can I just pick that one up? Because that's so important. Our patients will not be able to get private health insurance. Let's be clear about this. Those that have pre-existing diseases will not just be able to go off to whichever insurance and say, can I have insurance? So that is the message that we have to be going out. I get upset when I see the negative views about the NHS on Twitter because I say it isn't the NHS. It's, the, it's exactly what you've just said. It's the funding. It's the dismantling of the structures that work. And when they slag off the NHS, I say, well, and I don't want to say, but I say, well, you wait. In 10 years' time, you're slagging this off. Then see how much money you're going to have to pay to get the care that you want to get, that you're, you're whinging about now. So we do have to get the public on board. We have to stop them blaming doctors, please, and blaming GPs constantly. Or we have to say in advance, let's just blame GPs for everything now and get it over and done with and just get it. So I think you're absolutely right. Spot on. I think... 
It's exactly what I said at the start. Is <coughs> it's, it's not putting at the feet of the NH what's going on in the NHS at the, the feet of the professionals or yeah. the people who are working it. It's putting it. Yeah, everything that now. If you're on a waiting list, don't blame it on the NHS. Blame it on Cameron and Clegg, who pulled this legislation through. Blame it on them, who are saying, you know, blame it on Osborne, who's bringing through all these cuts. It's their fault, and that's who we've got to make sure feels it. It's not the professionals' mm. fault, because, you know, if you look, at, we know from our members, they are incredibly stressed, and they're incredibly, the staff morale at the moment is, but they will deliver a national health service because that they want to deliver it. They are there. Our members are there for the patients, that's why they're there. So we need to make sure that the people who feel it aren't the people who work in the NHS, but it is the politicians who have decided to do this to our National Health Service. So we have to keep on putting it at the feet, I cannot stress enough, of Cameron. Forget Lansley, let's stick it to Cameron, because ultimately it was his bill. And I'd like to, you know, at least something to stick to that man, considering what he's been doing. <laughs> um, there, and then unfortunately the last... One of the things that sort of echoes what you were saying, one of the things about um, bringing individual patient problems uh, and highlighting those problems is that we are up against a huge media machine, not only of the government but also of the private healthcare companies. And, buy, uh, and it's all too easy for them to turn it round and make it a doctor's and a, a, a structural problem on our part rather than a problem of the changes. So, and that's one of the things because we have the cuts, we have the restructuring, and it's very easy to say, well, it's all down to the cuts, but really if the GPs were managing it properly, this wouldn't have happened. So I think there is a risk in bringing individual patient uh, issues, although they, they're the things that hit home hardest, they're also the most difficult to kind of manage mm. in a press forum Jennifer, format. Yeah. Um, I did, I wanted to just quickly say something about, uh, Clive was saying you want to expand, you know, you, you want to be seen as a party that has a broader remit than just the health service, and I personally I think that's probably wrong. Mm -hmm. I think if you try and make yourself into a politician, you leave, you give yourself weak areas which they will shoot you down at the first opportunity. Whereas if you come on a single party, although in truth as a political machine it's not going to work, in terms of getting the message out to the public and getting the vote, you know, you can deal with the kind of the aftermath after. But in terms of keeping focused on, on what you stand for and what people will believe in, in you, I think the health issue should be the single focus. I really do. Um, and the other thing was about repealing the bill is that although it can't be repealed, I mean, the fundamental thing for me about repealing the bill is removing the purchase of provider split. Once that goes, there is no health, there is no health and social care act. And if it's possible to just take it out as easily as it was put in the health service, it'd need a lot of resettling and lots of local legislation to kind of mitigate the fallout from that, but the purchase of provider split is the market and um, perhaps that could be dealt with as a single political uh, issue. Before you ask that, yeah. can you, um, we also need people to wrap up, so if you could briefly yeah. make your closing points to that, that, that was a really helpful question because actually that helps me wrap up pretty much what I, what I wanted to say actually. Uh, I absolutely agree that the purchase of provider split is absolutely the, the mal malign influence on the whole system. Uh, and that's actually, uh, yeah, it's basically the purchase of provider split, those who don't know, it's basically GPs buying care from, you know, from hospitals, basically. Uh, so having contracts between, between each other when they should just refer the patients in and we'll just deal with it. We've got a single payer system. Why have a market within when you've got a finite amount of money? Completely disastrous that has been for the last 20 years. There was a Health Select Committee report about saying that, that was, it wasn't working. Uh, and, and that's where the NHS, because it isn't perfect, we have to accept that, but that's one of the reasons why the system isn't better than it is. Because because it completely interferes with the whole system. It puts you know, GPs against hospital doctors, and that's why you often get patchy care. So we have to acknowledge that NHS isn't perfect, but say, well, actually, it's not because, you know, okay, there's some professionals that aren't fantastic, the majority are very good, but it's due to the system, and we, need, we, need, we do want change, actually, but we want to move away from the direction they're going, which is even, even more pro-market. And that, and that takes us back to the point where Labour had big problems, because actually they, they, they made it worse, that, that system. They introduced payment by results, uh, they introduced 
plurality of providers, multiple providers, patient choice, all those sorts of things to stimulate the market. And that's why they were on dodgy ground. They actually set up the Health and Social Care Act really nicely, unfortunately. And that's why they struggled in the whole debate. Um, uh, coming to the, the, the single issue um, part of our party, that was certainly going to be a focus for the next few years. I'm talking about long-term long vision. I think uh, we need to get, because it takes years to make you know, proper policy, you have to have annual representative meetings, it's going to take time. So a lot of, us, a lot of our arguments are going to be based on principles rather than really detailed policy you know, to begin with. And just one thing about what we can do for the future uh, in terms of social media, it might be a really nice you know, opportunity for us if we can have a day of all the Twitterers uh, saying, you know, follow, follow the uh, National Health Action Party, you know, we're at NHA Party and just get as many followers as we can in a, in a day or do it for a few days and because uh, that will be useful for our funding streams, getting messages out there. I, I'm currently tweeting on behalf of um, at, at NHA Party at the moment so I can get the message di directly out. So that may be a way we could maybe talk about later how social media can help uh, our party. But. Uh, thanks for the question that helped me summarise. I'll, I'll be very brief. I, Don Berwick, the great Don Berwick, who's been setting up the Obama reform, uh, it said something very powerful last week. He said, doctors and managers, you're trusted. You have a trusted voice. And make sure that your voice is loud and consistent and that it's heard. And that's what I say to all of you, to my medical profession, uh, and to anybody that works in the NHS. Make your voice loud and make it heard. And for me, I would just say, you know, we have to continue this campaign. We have to continue at a local level um, to go back, you know, find out who else in your locality is doing this work and get together with them and continue to put that pressure on. And also, you know, as I, I can't stress it enough, on the 20th of October for us, this is going to be a big focus. And let's make a real <coughs> NHS presence felt on the 20th of October and get a million people out who are campaigning and saying, you know, this is our the national demonstration about what happened to them the National Health Service. Also, um, if you want to find out, you know, Unison, what Unison's up to on the NHS stuff, um, we've got two, I'm at Sean Rabi, R-A-B-I, on Twitter, but there's also Unis, at Unison RNHS, and that's the official Unison Health Campaign Twitter. Um, I would just say, um, I think that the emerging campaigns from groups like Keep Our NHS Public about private healthcare providers and think tanks direct Doing, uh, doing direct action which hits them economically and causes them PR embarrassment is quite important, potentially. But um, yeah, when UK Uncut's had success over the last couple of years, it's because we've done consistent actions week in, week out, just keep on building pressure, building momentum. And I think the October 20th will be the start of that coming back again in a big way. And so look forward to that. And if anyone needs any help with campaign ideas or support or to promote events, just drop us an email or tweet to UK at UK, UK, at UK Uncut and we'll promote what you're doing where you are. And thanks very much. Cheers. Can we have a quick round of applause for the team? And thank you for joining us.